Good morning, everyone. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't know if I've told this story before, but I'm, I will. Again, I, I often tell stories to begin things with about my childhood. So I, had, I had a great childhood. I really have good, great memories. This one, not so much, sort of. The, the year was 1968. And uh, for those of you who were around then, you know, the Steelers hadn't yet won anything. They hadn't won a championship yet in 1968. Uh, the Beatles were still together, and they were still making music. That's how long ago that was. And, and I was a first grader at the John F. Kennedy Elementary School on Crawford Avenue, about seven blocks down the road from my, my house, my mom and dad's house in Duquesne. My, uh, my mother loved me very much, and she still does. She does. And... Uh, she was always really interested in current events. She, she loved to keep up with things. She, she, she always read, you know, current magazines. She, she was up with, with the times. And, and she, uh, she thought it was important that her son be up with the times. And uh, so she had certain ideas about, about fashion for her, her six-year-old and what he ought to wear. And uh, she became aware uh, of one of the more unfortunate styles, in my opinion, of, of the 1960s. And... Uh, and, and that was the Nehru shirt. I don't know if you remember what a Nehru shirt was, but it, it's a shirt that has a, a, a banded collar, and then it's kind of notched out, sort of, like a, sort of like you'd see a Catholic priest, but without the white part, okay? And uh, my, my mom, the way she said it to me, she said, you, you know, Michael, um, they're, they're really snazzy. Is the word she used, you know? and, and the best I can tell, the word snazzy is a, is a contraction between, I think, being a snappy dresser that's probably like from her age in the, back in the 40s, and, and being jazzy, you know, snazzy. You don't hear that word very often. But it, Michael, it's, it's snazzy. And, and she said, and besides, it, they're, they're all wearing them. And, and so I didn't know. I'm six years old. Like, like who, Mom, I want to say now? Like who was wearing them? You know, a bunch of guys in Bangladesh and the Beatles and the monkeys, but who else was wearing it? I don't know. And uh, okay, so, so to make it worse, she goes and buys one for me, and uh, it's, it's pink. And I'm not saying like a, like a pale, it's shocking, bright, fuchsia pink. And, and, and in 1968, it's not like a, a guy's you know, pink shirts are kind of cool. They've been cool. But in 1968, for a, that was not a cool thing, okay? And so, and so here I, I get dressed up in this Nehru shirt, pink. Uh, uh, my sisters, they all are in agreement with it. You know, they're probably just making fun of me on the side. My dad, who, who's the guy who wouldn't let me play with a G.I. Joe, because he wouldn't let his son play with dolls, okay? He, he has nothing to say. He's silent all of a sudden. It's okay, but I can't play with a G.I. Joe, but it's okay for his boy to walk down Crawford Avenue in a, in a bright shade of pink. It's okay, it's okay. Thanks, Dad, for that, you know? Th- thankfully, thankfully, I think that, that fashion statement was, was just a fad, okay? And... and and like all fads, they kind of they kind of fade out. They they fade away. They go away, and and I'm I'm happy for that. I, I did grow out of it, of course, but it was replaced by in fourth grade the matching tie dye purple shirt and purple pants that came with it. So I I didn't escape at all, but it was it was different. But they're they're fads, and uh, our lives are are full of of fads and, and fashion being one. But uh, as, as we gather today in church, and certainly as we open up his book, his word to us, we recognize that uh, this life, this, uh, this faith, this Bible, this Christianity is anything but a fad that passes. It doesn't change. It remains. It is faithful because God is faithful. So turn with me today. I have copies in your bulletins of our scripture reading today. It's uh, Psalm 129. And again, for this series we're in, I'm uh, reading from the translation called The Message. And you know that I'm reading it from that translation because I think that it captures well the, uh, the passion and the emotion that is so full in the Psalms. So listen with me, read with me, the Word of God, Psalm 129. The psalmist says this, 
They kick me around ever since I was young. This is how Israel tells it. They've kicked me around ever since I was young. But they could never keep me down. Their plowmen plowed long furrows up and down my back. Then God ripped the harness of the evil plowman to shreds. Oh, let all those who hate Zion grovel in humiliation. Let them be like grass in shallow ground that withers before the harvest. Before the farmhands can gather it in, the harvesters get in the crop. Before the neighbors have a chance to call out, congratulations on your wonderful crop. We bless you in God's name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for your word that so richly blesses us and leads us and guides us Not in fads, Lord, but in truth and in faithfulness. Lord, I pray that you do that today, that you might use my words um, to ring true. Father, this text has difficult verses in it, and uh, we don't often know how to handle these difficult things that are said. But Lord, give us wisdom to to know. Uh, Help us discern and see clearly what's, what's right, what's good and affirming to you. Lord, help us to see clearly your message for us today. Father, I pray that you forgive me for any mistakes I will make. Let those things fade from our memories. But Father, everything that's true and lasting and good that accords with your word, let all those things take root deeply, deeply in our hearts and minds that we would bear fruit for your kingdom. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Anybody have a neighbor shirt out there? I don't want it. We've been working our way sequentially through this uh, particular section of the book of Psalms, Psalms 120 through 134, and they're commonly referred to as, collectively, the the Psalms of Ascent. And if you look in your translation of the Bible, you might well see beneath the title, where it says Psalm 120 or 121, you'll see in parentheses, it'll say, a Psalm of Ascent. And... uh, As we've discussed, it's believed that, according to Jewish tradition, that these psalms were put to music as as songs. They're they're prayer songs, is what they are. And they were sung by by Jewish pilgrims as they made their way to Jerusalem, up to Mount Zion, up to the temple to worship Yahweh. The great great feasts of of Passover, which was their deliverance. The feast of uh, Pentecost. That was the celebration of their covenant. The Feast of Tabernacles, that's the celebration of provision. These psalms were a collection. They were a collective and singing history of the people of Israel. They were the songs of the pilgrims of God, the disciples of God. And and last week, we looked at uh, Psalm 128. And if you were with us then, you'll remember that when we looked at Psalm 128, we saw the disciples of God singing about their their life of blessing. Do you remember that? The blessed life, the blessed life that that expands and multiplies. It's it's like a a man who sits at his table with his children. It's, It's like that. It's abundant. It invests. It gives rather than takes away. It, it gives out. It's a, it's a life of, of procreation. It's, it's all for creation. It speaks life into, doesn't draw life out of. It images God is what it does. It's what we were made for. That's why it's so natural for us to do. And when we live that blessed life for which we were created, there's, there's fulfillment and there's healing and there's, there's connection. It just happens that, that way. It's, it's the way God made us. And it's no longer a mystery when you're living that way why, why you would suddenly sort of you know, feel good after you've done something for a person or a child. Or you, it's no mystery anymore why you feel that special something deep down inside that you, you can't express when you come back from, say, a week on a, on a mission trip. You, 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 don't, you don't understand what that feeling is. Well, well it's not a mystery. You, you've stepped into the kingdom and you're living the image of God. You're living the blessed life when you do that, and so you feel that it's not a mystery, it's, it's what ought to be. 
It's a, it's a sampling of, it's a foretaste of, of what it means to be in the kingdom. It's what we're made, made to be. That's, that's a life of blessing, and it brings healing and community and wholeness. But this morning, we run headlong into Psalm 129, and it's, it's, a, it's an abrupt realization. There's words in here that are very troubling, okay? Uh, th- we see that the, the path of the, of the blessed life is, uh, is opposed. There's a, there's a blockage. There's resistance. There's inertia going against the grain. And it, it's the world. the world. The world systems work against the disciples of God. They do. They always have. The, the world rips holes in the path of the disciples of God. Whether it's political systems, economic systems, cultural systems, they, they act like giant sledgehammers that just, that just pound holes into the pavement. And they, they, they cause things like poverty and uh, economic devastation and separation and, econo- and environmental disaster. And, and the taking away of things from, from one set of people to another. It's, it's a taking away of life is what it is. It's not, it's not an adding to, it's not a multiplication. It's a, it's a redistribution. It's a, it's a taking away is what it is. And whether those systems take resources from the environment or take assets from those who are powerless or they even take life from those who are most vulnerable and who are never given a quote-unquote choice, all of those things are in direct opposition to giving life. They're opposed to a people who are for the creation. It's, a, it's against those who are, who are pro-creation. They don't tolerate those systems, a God who is above all things. And so as followers of this God who seek and and, and go after this blessed life, this life that gives life, we find ourselves in a place of distortion, a place of of disconnect, of brokenness, and even then pain and anger and persecution. And so so we have the question, well, what do we do about it? What do we do about this opposition that we have? What do we do about this world that, that just keeps banging us over the head, that, that won't let us proceed in kingdom ways? What do we do? Because we can just complain about it. We could. We could just say, I hate the world, and we could just go off on a rant and shut our doors and never go out again. Or we could stand there with our protest signs, and we could say, tell everybody, this is what I'm against, okay? But you see, those things don't give life, though. That just tells you what you're, what you're not for. That's, that's not what God calls us. To, that's not the path of this, the disciples. So, so, so here, what do we do? Here's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at Psalm 129, and we're going to join our voices to that chorus of Psalm 129 and see what that does. And you're going to have to loosen up your vocal cords because the psalmist is crying out. He... The psalmist is shouting here. He's yelling. He's screaming, okay? And so if you're going to join him, you're going to have to loosen up the vocal cords. Otherwise, you, you'll never hear yourself here. Because he says this, raw emotion, raw anger. They've kicked me. They've been kicking me all this time. Ever since I was young, they've kicked me. That's how Israel tells it. They've kicked me around ever since I was young. They're plowmen. They, they plow long furrows up and down my back. We don't know the pain that the psalmist had in particular, but we know that he speaks for Israel because he said, this is how Israel tells it. And we know something about their pain because we know their history, don't we? We, we know about, about their time in slavery in Egypt. We, we know about their persecution in their, in their promised land by the, the Edom, Edomites and the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Mighty Mites and all the other Mites. There was always constant struggle, persecution, battle, war, always. We know about the, uh, the persecution of the Assyrians, took away the, the tribes of the north never to return. The Babylonians came and they pillaged and sacked the south. Always, always strife, even internally, maybe mostly internally. Their own kings would forget about their God and mix in a little Yahweh worship, a little pagan worship, and, and they would just go along to get along. And they would continually go through processes and cycles of forgetting who they were, forgetting the God they worshipped, and going after another one. All those who were disciples of God were being kicked around, smashed in the teeth, having 
furrows up and down their back by those outside and those inside. And the psalmist, lays, he just lays it out. He can't hold it anymore. He's so angry. Listen to the anger. Venom. Vin, it's vindictiveness. Look at, look at verse 5. It's horrific what he said. Look at his prayer. Here's what he wants. Here's what he wants. Oh, let those who hate Zion, let them grovel in humiliation. I want them to grovel. Let them be like grass in shallow ground that withers before the harvest, before anybody can say, blessings to you. Let, let them be, God, snuff them out. The, the, the psalmist has such anger built up, such indignation. And, and, and it makes you wonder, what's this even doing in the Bible? Because I, I think what, what's here is you see a psalmist who's, who's wanting to, to bring, he wants harm to come to these people who've done them bad. And, and I think it's, it's raw emotion. It's, it's real life. I don't think it's honoring to God, but, I, but it's real. He wants retribution. I think what we're seeing here is, is pure, unadulterated, unfiltered emotion. And let's face it. We oftentimes in our lives have similar emotions where when someone does us a bad turn, we might, we might wish some, some kind of calamity on that person. It's, it's human nature. But why in the Bible? What do we, what do we take from this, this set of very angry verses that are in the Bible? Because this, this song's been given to us as, as a disciple song. What, what are we to make of this? Does this mean that we're to pray this way? Does it mean we're to, we're to be angry this way? I've got, I got to think about this. We've got to think about this. Obviously, an important part of this song is intended to express this deep this deep emotion, this, this, this raw emotion. And I, and I think part of this means that when we go to God, we don't pretend to come to him all cleaned up and tidied up, okay? When we're raw and we're full of emotion, however right or, or wrong it is, the psalmist is telling us, you take that to God, and you take it right now. Don't, don't snuff it down. Don't go gossip about it. Don't hold a protest sign. God wants to hear about that. He knows it anyway. You, it's not like you can not tell him something. Okay, even if you, if you express it right, he, he knows. So you might as well tell him. He, so he's saying, be honest. Take it. Show it. You can shout at him. He can, he can handle it. Take it. Be honest. Allow him to, to feel your anger and let him speak to you. Speak truth. Speak, reach out to the God who is, to the God who listens, and then learn to trust him more. Take your pain doesn't mean that he's going to magically make it disappear. He doesn't work that way. But you know, something else is going to happen. Something much more important. Relationship. Relationship building. Real relationship. Right relationship. They're built, are they not, over time. When you know, when you love someone, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it builds days, weeks, months, years, lifetimes. Your relationships are, are forged, not, not just when life is easy, but, but when, when the storms come. When, when the chips are down, that's when you know who your real friends are. When, when things get difficult, it's when you're down and not at your best, when you're suffering and you don't have any makeup on, that your most meaningful and your most lasting relationships blossom. That's the message of Psalm 129. It sings out, they took me around me around. But they could never keep me down. They could never keep me down, even though they kicked me. They're plowmen plowed long furrows up and down my back. But then, but then God ripped the harness of the evil plowman to shreds. God did this. Have you ever felt kicked around? Have you ever felt, have you ever felt abused? Have you ever felt persecuted for what you believe? Have you ever, have you ever been made fun of? Have you ever been left out? You ever been, you ever been sub, the subject of gossip? Have you ever been in that position? I have been. Listen to the song of the disciple of God. They kicked me around, but God. They abused me, but God. They persecuted me, but God. They lied about me, but God. So if you've been, if you've been kicked around, the place to start with that is by adding your voice the chorus of Psalm 129. 
and taking your pain directly to God and allow Him to, to teach you to grow in patience and even perseverance. Allow him, to, allow him to act on your behalf, to heal you, to bring you to a place where you can breathe life again into people and situations. And you start by, by taking your anger and your frustration and your rage and you shout it to him. You shout it to him. The Christian faith is not a fragile style of life. It just doesn't give blessing when the sun shines. It flourishes and it grows when it's dark. And if it doesn't do that, it's not worth much, is it? It'll fade. It'll be only a fad if it only comes out when the sun shines. Living in God's ways, living in life's, life's blessing, means saying yes to Him and no to the world, and that does cause pain. It causes pain. Here's, here's one biblical writer's view of what this pain looks like. See, I'm going to read this. See if you can recognize the subject here. He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. He was looked down on, passed over, passed by, a man who suffered and knew pain. One look at him, and people turned away. People like me turned away. What would come from a life like that, a life of pain and persecution? And rejection, not much you would think, not much on the surface, would you think? What would come of that? Look at the results. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we're healed. Life, life. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. Because of his suffering, we're given life. Of course, this is the account of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. And what we see is that a life of faith is what lasts. A life of perseverance lasts. It's no, it's no fad. Have you been kicked? Have you had furrows run up and down your back from time to time? Add your voice to the chorus of Psalm 129. And, and so, know that it's not some feel-good, empty exercise. It's not some silly saying like, let go and let God. No, it's not that at all. It is giving to Him what you are and what you have and allowing Him to take you as you are and reshape you and remold you and heal you and let you once again not speak victimization, not speak anger, but speak life again. Life of blessing as an image bearer of him. He is a God who perseveres. Go to him with your brokenness and allow him to teach you patience and how to persevere and make you whole again. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today to us. Your word that is for us today unusual because of the, the anger that we read. But Father, thank you for letting us see that uh, in this, it's, it's right, it's best to, uh, to give to you those things that we feel, that we ought not try to cover things up or make things tidy and neat before we approach you, Lord. Lord, help us to know what it means to really lean into you, to trust you, to, to bring our whole selves to you so that we can become reshaped and reformed and remade more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for allowing us and showing us a way to lay all that bare before you and to be bowed in humility and humbleness, Lord, to your, 
healing and saving grace. Father, I pray for everyone in this congregation today that's assembled, that if there are people broken, relationships crushed, uh, objects of gossip, whatever it might be, Lord, I pray that you come now and allow allow us all to to bring that to you and, and seek healing and forgiveness. Lord, come and touch those who need to feel that that wholeness that only you can give. Certainly, Lord, for all those who are are sick, recovering from illness, preparing for surgery, Lord, come and give peace, come and give healing. Lord, grant, I pray, that we would receive the things that are good for us. Lord, come and give those things. Father, we pray for life. We certainly pray for this culture, that this culture would be lifted up, Lord, and you would allow us to find ways to to enter into it, to enter into the conversation and allow us to find ways to speak life for the unborn, life for those who are born but have been disenfranchised. Lord, those who, uh, who feel hopeless, Lord, let us come and speak life as you would have us do. And Father, we join our voices together as one body today. We pray and we use the words given to us by Jesus Christ as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have uh, today with us uh, our friend, Mrs. Carrie Muir. Uh, Carrie is the uh, executive 